Well, good evening. It's wonderful to be with you this evening at Jones Road. Thank the el- I want to thank the elders for the invitation to come and talk to you about the Lord's work in Zimbabwe. I know that you're supporting at least one brother over there, and we'll be uh, mentioning him as we go along in the report tonight. And uh, I want to just start with a couple of passages of Scripture before we get into looking at what I took to Zimbabwe. In In Acts chapter 11 and verse 22, it's interesting that when the church was scattered, men went everywhere preaching the word. And the gospel spread uh, through Samaria and up into parts of Asia even, as far as Antioch. And the church in Jerusalem, when they got the news of this, uh, in Acts 11 and verse 22, they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. The, The church had not sent out these men to evangelize. They'd left from there. But the church in Jerusalem was interested in the well-being of Christians in other places. We all are in part of a worldwide fellowship. We're in the body of Christ. And it is really our duty and responsibility to love and care for brethren all over the world and to be concerned about their well-being, to be concerned about the spread of the gospel. You see that as a pattern, as an example, with the Jerusalem church here. And then over on, of course, in Acts chapter 14 and verse 27, When Paul and Barnabas were in Antioch, they were sent out by that church and by the Holy Spirit to spread the gospel. And when they had finished their first trip, they come back to Antioch, and it says in verse 27, they came and they they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done with them. So an assembly like this, where the whole church is gathered together, and you're hearing a report about what has been done by evangelists in the gospel, that's biblical. If somebody leaves tonight and wonders, well, what did we do there tonight anyway? Well, what we did was what they did in Scripture, okay? (laughs) That's a biblical thing to do. And besides that, not only did Paul and Barnabas report this at a church that had sent them out, just a few verses later in Acts chapter 15, they go down to Jerusalem and give the Jerusalem church a report about what they did. So again, this is highly, highly scriptural thing to do and an important thing to do. I just want to say one other thing before I really get started. Looking at this first chart, I'm going to say that uh, my charts aren't jiving with your projector. So some of the words are going to be funny, uh, looking in the wrong places and things like that. That's modern, uh, you know, electronics for us. We're just going to have to put up with that. But um, I think you'll still maybe get the message of this report tonight. We're talking about the Lord's work in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe uh, has a land area about the size of Tennessee, Alabama, and Georgia combined. It's obviously in the southern part of Africa. It borders to the south, South Africa. Mozambique is uh, to the east. Botswana is to the west. And you have Zambia uh, to to the north. So those are some of the border countries of of Zimbabwe. It has about 15 million in population, uh, the nation of Zimbabwe. And there are hundreds and hundreds of sound churches in Zimbabwe. There are uh, thousands of Christians. I personally know over a hundred gospel preachers who are preaching in Zimbabwe, whom I have met personally. The gospel has been in Zimbabwe, the true gospel, for at least 120 years, probably longer than that. So a lot of work has been done uh, we who go there now are really standing on the shoulders of giants, men like Foy Short and Patty Kindleball, who have done a lot of great work over there in decades past. But the work continues, and it's growing, really at an amazing pace. The fields are white in Zimbabwe. There are willing workers. What they need is our prayers, our encouragement, and sometimes our financial support, as you'll understand in a little bit. There's a lot of poverty and unemployment in Zimbabwe. By some estimates, there's a 90% unemployment rate in Zimbabwe. Droughts are a regular occurrence there. It used to be, this used to be the country of Rhodesia. And when it was controlled by the white man, uh, it was the breadbasket of Southern Africa. Uh, They had farms. They used labor that they really didn't pay much for. And the farms were well run according to modern technology. They could produce a lot. But there was a revolution there. Most of the whites were driven out of the country. It became the country of Zimbabwe. And there weren't really a lot of people left there who knew how to run the farms. 
And so all of that fell into disrepair. The farms, a lot of them are just being farmed by village people who are doing their best, but they don't know how to run a big farm to grow a lot of stuff. And on top of that, tremendous uh, weather changes have occurred there. It's a semi-arid place to begin with, uh, and you'll see in the pictures uh, there are a lot of dry places in Zimbabwe where it's hard to grow crops unless you get rain at the right time. So you've got all of those problems, and you have severe economic problems as well. Food shortages now are common. If you look at the country of Zimbabwe, there are four tribes that inhabit the country. There might be a fifth that I could talk about, but for our purposes, I met with uh, people from the Shauna tribe, the Indabeli tribe, the Tonga tribe, and the Vinda tribe. Most of the brethren are either Shauna or Indabeli. In fact, typically as you look at the nation of Zimbabwe, it's divided up into those two regions, with the Shauna uh, being the larger of the two tribes, about 80 to 85 percent of the population, and Indabeli being the rest. Uh, the trip that I took was to the Shauna side. I'll show you that in a minute. East Side Church uh, here in Athens is supporting nine men on the Shauna side, nine preachers there, and we visited with every one of them and visited every church in which they preached. That's 19 churches that we visited on the recent visit in July. Uh, on the Indabeli side, there are quite a few churches as well, some really good men working. Each side is supporting one man over there, big boy Dubé. And Lord willing, I'm going to go in a week and a half back to Zimbabwe and visit with big boy and do some work on the Indabeli side. So the... Report tonight is about our evangelism trip that occurred June 28th through July 14th of this year. And if you look at the country of Zimbabwe on a road map, uh, on the, the left side, the eastern side, you have the capital of Harare. And uh, we landed there, if I can figure out how the pointer works here, uh, in Harare, and went out from there uh, visiting uh, Mutari, which is a pretty good sized city on the border of Mozambique. We spent a few days there. We went down to Chiridzi uh, and visited one of the men that we support there. We went up to Wedza. There are three guys that we're supporting there. We visited the churches there. And then up to Merewa, where uh, Tafadzwa Calvin Kandua works, as well as uh, th two other preachers that Eastside is supporting. So we'll I'm going to tell you about the trip and the things we did and the experiences that we had just in brief. And when I say we, um, I'm talking about these seven guys, primarily. Uh, they are Damon Ferris, myself, Lowell Sali. Reason Marara is in the middle of that picture, and Reason works with uh, Tafadzwa Calvin, as I think you call him here. Uh, Gary Boyd, one of the elders from East Side, went with us. Takawera Mukono and Trimor Tozola are the guys that are closest to you there on the right. Uh, the, the three Zimbabwean preachers are highly experienced, highly motivated, highly knowledgeable, very, very good men, and uh, able also to drive long distances in a single bound uh, to take us places <laughs> that we needed to go. So they're wonderful brothers in Christ and were very helpful for us facilitating the work that we needed to do. So we get to, um, uh, down to Mutari, and we go out the first day south of Mutari to a place called Chamanamani. Uh, and there, East Side is supporting this young man, Fadzanai Chingwingwi, and his wife, who he's married just in the last couple of years, Niasha. Their little daughter, Cleopatra, is there. And uh, Fadzanai works with two ch churches in this district. I was there in 2019. There was only one church in this whole district, uh, and it lost its preacher shortly after I left. We asked Fadzanai, a young preacher, he was single at the time, to go down in this area and see what he could do. He's gone down, he's planted two other churches, uh, gotten married and had a baby. So he's been really <laughs> doing a lot since I was there in 2019. And uh, we visited with him. Uh, this is an area that was hit by Hurricane Idai back in 2019. It pretty much wiped out this whole area, all of the agriculture. What you're looking at there, all of those rocks in that riverbed did not used to be there. There was a, a huge flood from Idai, and all of those rocks washed down from the mountain and washed out a lot of their good bottom farmland that they had been using. So it's a really difficult place to eke out a living nowadays, but there's still lots of folks living in the villages there and doing the best they can. 
So we visited first with the church at Shinja. This is a church that uh, Fadzan I, along with some other preachers helping him, have planted in the last couple of three years. You see lots of women and children, a good many men. It's a, it's a good growing church, enthusiastic, I can tell you that. Uh, this is a typical arrangement of churches over there when you meet with them. The women will be sitting on the ground with the children. The men, if there are um, log benches or something to sit on, they'll be sitting up in those. That's just their culture. It uh, doesn't really say much about the churches. It's the way they are culturally. In any public gathering, the women will be separated from the men, and, and it's a very uh, patriarchal, man-run culture. It's just the nature of how they are. But uh, they're very loving people. Their families are typically very strong, family-oriented people. And uh, the nation as a whole is a fairly godly nation compared to the United States, it certainly is. So this is Fadzanai, where he's working in Shinja. Uh, we also went out uh, to uh, another congregation that I'd uh, seen before in this area, went out on this road. This is my bro brother Gary uh, Boyd standing on a really typical road in Shimanamani. Actually, this is a nicer road than most of them. I'll show you some of the roads as we go along. You might be wondering uh, why somebody like Tafazwa Calvin uh, Kandua has asked for help with a car and uh, sometimes repairs for that car. Uh, you might be wondering how preachers and why preachers need cars over there. I want you to pay attention to these roads and to the places that we're going that they would have to travel otherwise by foot or possibly public transportation if it were available. And I'll explain that in just a little bit. This is the road we went on that day, some good distance out to a second congregation, the church at Matayashi in this area of Chamanamani. This is where I visited uh, in 2019 where I was, when I was there, and this group is still doing really well, and we enjoyed our visit there. So we're on the way back uh, to Matari that night on, on the road out of the Chamanamani area, and of course you have to pass a slow-moving vehicle. This is a, only a two-ox power cart, and the road was only one lane, so you have two vehicles you know, trying to pass. We have that all the time in the States, right? Uh, you see the, the man driving the other vehicle does not look happy that we're trying to, trying to pass him. But that's, that's what you run across a lot in the area. Before we left the area, we visited the house of Fadzanai uh, and his uh, young wife and child. And I just want to show you how they live. Now, Fadzanai is living probably about average for a preacher over there, uh, especially for a very young one that's just starting out. Uh, this is... This is the water source. It's, you notice that's not inside. Uh, he's lucky, fortunate to have water where he can get to right outside his house where he's living. This is the toilet. This is outside also. Uh, I did not go inside the building to take that picture because the building doesn't have a roof. This is outside, and what you're looking at there is uh, that square uh, piece of rock is what you lift up where the hole is. There's no seat, there's nothing like that, there's no running water. This is a typical toilet all the way throughout Zimbabwe. And this may be too much information for some people, but you need to know how these folks live. They're not living like you are. And this is the preacher's house, except it's really not. It's really the schoolmaster's house in this district, and Fadzanai and his wife are living in the left side of it in one room. Uh, so that's, that's where they live. And they're fortunate to have this place really out in the middle of nowhere, uh, to accommodate them. Well, the next day, we go up and visit um, a man that I've known since 2015. His name is Clinton, and he works in uh, the area of the Handi Valley in Hauna. The town is called Hauna at the Muparutsa Church. You see Clinton there uh, with his uh, lovely wife, Sharon, uh, three of their children, and me and Gary, this is at their house, really, after uh, we had worshipped with them. Here's the church at Maparutsa. You see a lot of kids, a lot of families, uh, strong church, really good people. When I first visited this church, and the church, the first time I was there was 2016, I visited this church, I visited Clinton, met his family. Besides Clinton and his family, there were eight people in this church. This is the work that he's done uh, and the Lord has done in the meantime, growing this church. It's getting more and more mature all the time 
And uh, one, of the, one of the young girls from East Side, uh, as a gift to some of the children in Zimbabwe, braided a bunch of bracelets out of colored rubber bands. And so since there were so many children there, I gave those out after services were over. And uh, they were really happy to get them. So we're all raising up our bracelets to show everybody. Children happy to receive those, those bracelets made by a young girl from East Side. People appreciate you. They appreciate us coming. And they'll give us whatever they have. They may not have much. In this particular area, the uh, Hondi Valley is the most fertile place in Zimbabwe. It's on the far eastern uh, side of Zimbabwe. It's uh, in a mountain valley that is uh, wet and stays a little bit warmer. As you'll see, there are palm trees, there are banana trees, there are avocados, sugar cane. That's what they can grow there. This is unlike the rest of Zimbabwe, so it's very unusual. But that's what they gave us. Of course, we couldn't bring any of that home on the airplane, but wish we could. But we did eat the bananas, I can tell you that. They didn't go to waste. So those are the kind of people you run into. Those are the kind of people you're dealing with. Um, this is a picture as we're leaving the Hondi Valley. You see in the distance the mountains, the fertile valley below. Uh, the things coming down those mountains are waterfalls uh, coming all the way down those mountains. So just a very picturesque, beautiful sight. And not, not one that's really common in the interior of, of, of Zim, but uh, one that you really appreciate God's masterpiece of his creation when you get to see something like that. The next day was Sunday, July 3rd. We went out with Trimore to his home congregation, the group that he works with. There are some other Christians visiting there. I estimate there are about 200 in this particular gathering uh, there at Matika. And uh, I was privileged to be able to preach there along with one of the other preachers that was with me on that Sunday morning. Normally, when we preach in the villages, well, not normally, all the time, when we preach in the villages, the preachers that we work with can usually speak English pretty well. Uh, the villagers... Some of them can. They, the children learn English in school. It's one of the official languages of Zimbabwe. But most of the village people cannot speak English. And so we always use a translator uh, when we're in these situations. And uh, on this particular day, I actually forget who translated for me here. But uh, you always have a translator. And he's sort of got to be your co-preacher. <laughs> he's got to work with you and uh, help you get through <laughs> what you're trying to convey to the group. So it's very important that you have a good, faithful brother translating for you as you're trying to get across some key points of Scripture. Uh, we leave there, going to another church on that particular Sunday, and we passed, as we were going along the way, an SUV on the other side of the road. This is a sugarcane utility vehicle, obviously. Uh, and again, another ox cart. And a lot of people, that's what they use to move their things around, sometimes for their own transportation. You don't see oxen so much. No, normally it's donkeys, but nonetheless you see a lot of these either donkey or oxen-drawn carts. We go out the same day to uh, visit Tinson Manguignana. Tinson is really the first African preacher that I got to know well back in 2011. Tinson's visited the United States uh, three times. Some of you may have met him. Uh, he's visited Athens a couple of times. Uh, but he used to work at Victoria Falls on the other side of the country, and he's just a year and a half ago gone back to his rural village where he was born and grew up to plant a church and get the church going there. So this is out in an area called Niangani, which is his home village. They've got a little shed that uh, some individuals from America helped him build there to, to meet under. It's not quite a big congregation yet, but they're growing, as you'll see in just a moment. Uh, there we are preaching at Niangani, and this is Reason Marara translating for me there. And six people stood to confess Christ as Lord and be baptized for the remission of their sins in the group that was gathered there. And that's uh, Tinson hearing their confessions uh, there in the middle and then going out to a nearby river. Interestingly, in English, it looks like the Save River, which is would be a cool river to baptize in. They actually pronounce it Save, but... It's where people get saved, so I like the Save River. Um, it's a river, by the way, where just the week before there was a crocodile attack right in this place where we were baptizing. That's another thing you have to concern yourself with. Are there crocodiles in these waters when you're baptizing folks? And we were, we were looking around. I was definitely looking around to make sure that there, there were not, uh, and thankfully we didn't see any. We're thankful for those that obeyed the gospel that day. 
One of the things that we try to do when we go to Zimbabwe, as I said, there are a number of mature preachers, not all of them by any means. There are, are, are some that are just beginning, some that really haven't had the chance to study deeply in Scripture. Uh, but we try to work with the mature preachers, the knowledgeable men, to train the others, so to speak. We, as Americans going over there, we understand that we're not as effective as they are going out in the villages. We don't speak the language. We don't know the people. Those guys are great at evangelizing. These six people that were baptized that day that was, had virtually nothing to do with Steve Klein preaching there that day. That was the work that was done by Tinson Mangwanyana in that village. And uh, when you see pictures of a lot of baptisms, they're the ones, those guys, that are working and, share, and spreading the gospel. God's given the increase, but it's, it's their labor and their work that you're seeing the fruit of on those occasions. And I want to be clear about that. But one of the things that we do try to do is, if I can get this to advance, is that we try to have studies for preachers, especially the ones who aren't as mature, who, who maybe aren't quite as grounded. So over the years, uh, we've had uh, group studies with between 30 to 40 preachers at a time in various places. We've done 11 of these. It's usually myself, and in this case, it was Lowell Salee and Gary Boyd that conducted these studies. Uh, often it's been myself and Joe Greer and Tad Corder. Sometimes some other preachers have gone with us to help with these. But we have 30 or 40 guys get together. We come to a lodge, to a central place. We stay for two or three days. We study from uh, dawn till after dusk, uh, going over some very important fundamentals that the guys need to be aware of. Uh, I get asked sometimes, now, now do these preachers, do they know the difference between uh, institutionalism and, yeah, they know. Do they know how to establish authority? Mm-hmm, they know. They know, I would say, as much as any typical American preacher does about a lot of the things that we call issues. Do they understand about marriage, divorce, and remarriage? By and large, they do. Now, some of the village preachers have a hard time with it because polygamy is still legal over there, and that can be a question that we get sometimes in these studies. What about polygamy? Uh, those are the things that you, you get. But we did have a two-day study on this trip, and that's what I'm leading up to. We had a, a class for about 30 preachers at an area up in the mountains called Vumba that's near Mutari, this border town uh, next to Mozambique. Um, these were arranged by Takawira and Trimore and Reason. They were facilitated by Tafadzwa, by that I mean Calvin, uh, facilitated in that he helped get a lot of the people there, a lot of the guys, the other preachers that needed rides. Uh, Tafadzwa was instrumental in getting them there. And you see him in this picture. He is, uh, I think, down here at the bottom with the big smile. Um, but he was instrumental in helping us with this as well. So the topics that we covered, and as I said, the, some of the words are cut off there because of the difference in our electronics here, but some of the topics that we covered were authority, the work of the church, the necessity of appointing elders in local congregations and the work of elders, also the work of evangelists and temptations of evangelists. Those are some of the topics that we covered in this uh, two-day intensive study. This is a, a picture of the venue there inside. Um, here, the lesson was the role of preachers in developing and appointing elders. Uh, there, right now in Zimbabwe, as I said, there are hundreds of churches I don't know of any church in Zimbabwe that has elders. But like any church, they all need elders. It's a matter of developing and maturing men to qualify. One of the problems in the country is that it is a male-dominated society. A lot of men think they're, think they're too good for church. It used to be that way in America about 100 years ago. And so a lot of the congregations are 70, 80 percent women and children. Uh, you see that a lot in a lot of places you go. But these brothers understand the importance of working with the men that they have and developing men to be elders serving in the Lord's church. This is the view from that particular lodge. Uh, not a bad view when you got to walk outside for a few minutes and get a breath of air. Uh, again, God does amazing things in this world, and we're privileged to be able to 
be able to see some of those. Well, the next day, uh, we, we separated from Lowell and Damon and uh, Trimore and Taka, and uh, Reason and Gary and I went down far to the south to an area uh, known as Cherizzi. Uh, they grow a lot of sugar cane in this area. Eastside supports this man. Uh, his name is Shepherd Maviza. Here's his wife, Rejoice. Their two children, Innocent and Belva, are the names of their children. And then uh, the other young lady there is Rejoice's sister. So Shepherd works with three churches in this area. And as you see, two of them are somewhat north of Cherizzi, about an hour and a half to two hour drive, maybe up to those areas. It's quite a, quite a distance. But he's trying to work with all three of these churches without a car, without a vehicle. He's somebody that needs a vehicle, frankly. Uh, and I'll show you why. Here are going down to Visa, or Vesa, the first of these villages that we visited. There are some obstacles along the way, like a mountain that you have to go around. Here's the road that we were on in the middle picture. What you see there is a bridge, but it's not a bridge. It's a washed out bridge. And so you had to go down into the real little river there, that we call it a creek, and cross that, ford the creek, uh, to get, go on on the road. Then you have cattle crossing the road. Uh, there are no restrictions on animals there whatsoever. So any road, whether it's paved or not, you're liable to see cows and goats and sometimes wild animals. It's not uncommon for us to see baboons and monkeys crossing the road, all of that as well. Uh, so far on my trips to Zimbabwe, I've been in the vehicle when we've hit one cow, two goats on different occasions, and this last trip, a human being uh, was on the road and just ran right out in front of us. Uh, hope, thankfully, he was not hurt. But those are the kind of you know, obstacles that you face as you travel in Zimbabwe. Here we are preaching at Vesa. You notice there's no shelter. There's no thing for them to be under. Uh, there's not a shed, nothing for this church to meet under. And you'll see that church after church after church in these villages. They could use shelters. In the rainy season, it's very hard for churches to meet. In the hot season, which comes after the rainy season, it's pretty hard for churches to meet. These brothers and sisters were so happy to see us that day and uh, listen carefully to the lesson and six souls confessed the Lord and were baptized into Christ at Vesa that day. Um, a good work and good people in that area. Shepherd is facilitating the work. This man that you see doing the baptizing uh, does a lot of the work when Shepherd can't be there. Uh, we go from there uh, about an hour and a half or so to an area called Chibamba. It's another rural area. Here we are again meeting out in the open. Pretty good crowd, pretty good sized congregation. This is one that Shepherd has worked with for several years, and uh, we're really happy to be with them that day. And then the next day, after we spend the night down in Cherizzi, we uh, go out to the, the main work that Shepherd's working with. This work is on a farm. I mean, I don't know what else to say. It's like an old timey farm. Uh, they've got you know cows and chickens and pigs and everything, and some of that was running around us as we were having services that day. Uh, so that's not uncommon there either. They have a bit of a covering, a shed, but as you see, it wasn't near big enough. Uh, we left Shepherd some money to get some more tin for that shed and expand it a little bit. I got a message from him today. They're having so many people there, about 80, uh, coming out for Sunday services now that the shed's still not big enough, and he's asking if we can't send him some more funds for a, a bigger shed in that area. Um, great group of people. It was a, a, a joyous day of worship. As, as, as we left that area, I, I, I thought to show these pictures to you. These are things that you just see along the road. You see kids walking to school. These children on, on the left side of this picture over here, you see hundreds of these children walking along the road. Whether it's 7, 8 o'clock in the morning or, four, or 5 o'clock in the evening, they're walking to school in their uniforms, and they're walking from school. Children ages 5 to 17. 
Sometimes you see five-year-olds by themselves walking along the road going to school. Their parents don't have cars to take them. They don't have run school buses there. The school may be five, six miles away from where they live. And this is how it happens all over the country in these rural areas. You're driving along, and if you're fortunate, you may see some of the wildlife. The, the second picture there is not very clear, but it's a couple of antelope we saw in the distance, uh, some um, water bucks, they're called. And we're always, uh, we always love it when we get to see some of the African wildlife. And then you, this lady, uh, I got to tell you about her. She was at the next place we went to, but uh, the table that she's carrying on her head, all the women carry everything on their head. Heads. So you'll see women with a five-gallon bucket of water, filled with water, where they've gone to the village borehole to get water, and they fill it with water, and they put it on their head. Imagine how much that weighs. And they balance it on their head and walk the mile or two or three back to their house. You see that over and over and over again with burdens, whether it's a bucket of water or whatever it is. You see the shed there. Oh, the woman's carrying a table that was used as our podium for where we preached. It came from her house, so she's carrying it home uh, after services were over. The shed there was, uh, the hut was near the Cheridzi meeting place. Again, I'm not getting this thing to advance for some reason. There we go. Here are a couple of other things that we've, we saw along the way. Uh, when they have to use public transportation on the left, this is the public transportation, I'm sorry, on the right, I don't know my right from it, no, I'm on the left. <laughs> uh, this is the public transportation that's typically used. That's just like a 10 passenger van with about 20 people in it. And that guy's probably going 50, 60 miles an hour down the road. The guy riding on the back is the conductor. He collects the money and he was riding on the back. He can't get in it because there are 20 people in there already. They're, they're, they're traveling to some place, wherever they're going, you know, it's, it's a taxi, and they have all these people in there, and they'll go, sometimes on these dirt roads, sometimes out in the middle of nowhere, they'll take somebody for a fee, uh, and with all these people jammed in there, your belongings are on the top, usually in a sack, because they don't have luggage, you know, it's in, in a sack on the top, so that's how, if you don't have a car, that's how you travel, or you walk, uh, and the vast majority of people in Zimbabwe know how to travel like this and travel like that on a regular basis. When well, we go from Chiridzi all the way up then to a place called Wedza, and uh, in, in Wedza there are um, three men that we support from east side. I first met these men in 2015. Uh, Everson, Duarte, Innocent Shaninga, and Tawanda Chikata. Um, when I first met them, uh, I was impressed by their sincerity, by their devotion, and also by their poverty. They are living in a very, very poor area of Zimbabwe. They're all three of them village preachers who, when I first met them, had virtually nothing in this world. In 2017, I went back to Wedza, or went to Wedza really for the first time, and preached in the three churches where those three men were working. This is where Innocent was preaching at the time. My translator was Tafadzwa Calvin Kandua. This is back in 2017. I would met Tafadzwa a couple of years before, but Tafadzwa was a good, good translator, and I always like it when I have him to do my translating. Not quite as sharp in English as a couple of the other guys, but he's, he's very devoted, does a good job expressing what I, what I like to have expressed, so I appreciate him a lot. But this was Wedza back then. These are the three brethren again and their families uh, that are working to spread the gospel in this area. The three churches that were there in 2017 are on the bottom. Uh, going across, they are Moringambiri, Mukandwa, and Godzira. The four churches that you see meeting across the top that we met with are new. All of those have been planted since 2017. Uh, these three brethren are preaching at churches near where they live, but then also going out even further into the bush, planting other churches, growing those churches. The thing you see is the bottom three churches that have been established for a while all have meeting places. The top four churches, they don't even have sheds to meet under. Uh, they're all meeting out in the open right now. Go to Dindignore, St. Joseph, and Maruta. 
In Wedza, American individuals, not churches, but individuals have provided uh, things that are very helpful for the saints there to improve their standard of living a little bit, boreholes and water tanks, uh, restrooms slash outhouses for some of the meeting places, uh, church building or two in the area, uh, vehicles for preachers, and many, many Bibles. East side just not, I won't even tell you the figure, but East side since I've been back from Zimbabwe has purchased something like... Uh, 150 Bibles, maybe more than that, for distribution over there. Here's why these preachers need vehicles. Here's what they're using them for. Those are the roads they're going on, miles and miles, out to these churches in these villages to evangelize. Yeah, the, the vehicles are, are going to break down. And they're going to need new suspension every year or two. Uh, lots of problems like that. But they're valuable in the work. And I encourage uh, the use of them there by guys who are preaching the gospel. All these brethren, they love to have you in their homes. We visited in all of these homes while we were there. Uh, Tawanda, Innocent, Tafadzwa, Calvin's home. I'll show you that in a bit. Uh, Tazvitia, who we support, who works with Calvin. Uh, Clinton, Everson, all of these guys. We were in their homes and others. Some of the food we ate uh, at the top left Bottom left, you get rice, you get sudza, which is their common meal. We get meat. They don't normally have meat. Uh, those are whole mackerel that you're seeing on top there uh, on the left that they, they, they fed us. And then at the bottom, that sudza, and this is at, at Calvin's house, by the way, uh, Tafadzwa's house that y'all support. We got some sudza and a piece of chicken and some kove, which is um, a kovo, which is kind of like a cross between turnip greens and collards or something like that. <laughs> so not bad, pretty good. Um, and then we got what, what Tafadzwa's wife called uh, same size small boys. That's what's on that little plate. You see on that little plate right there? Same size small boys are little tiny fish and they're all the same size and they're small. And so she calls them same size small boys and uh, they just kind of fry them up and get, get that with your, with your meal. Uh, also, I ate a worm. I just had to show you that. That's eating a Mopani worm uh, one night. It was delicious. Um, so we left from uh, Wedza and then go up to Murewa, where uh, Calvin works and Reason and Tazvitia. These three brothers have joined hands. They live together in the town. It is a town of Murewa. Uh, but they, they work in villages surrounding there. They travel out to four different villages uh, preaching the gospel. So let me share with you uh, about some of the work that's being done there. This is the church at Shevanawa. This is Sunday, July 10th. It's Gary Boyd preaching. It's a good-sized church. This is the most mature of these four congregations. It's been there a good long time. I think I visited it the first time in 2015, but it's been there for many years. It's, uh, they've got some mature people there and some brethren that maybe someday could be appointed as elders in that congregation. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of children in this good congregation. There you see Gary with a bunch of the children that are there. Um, then we went uh, that evening kind of across to the other side of Murewa and preached at Nyangarue. Uh, this is a fairly new group. What, what I really like about it, one thing was that they built their own shed. They did the poles. Somebody had an old, huge tent tarp, and they're using that for a temporary roof. Uh, they did all of that themselves, a fairly brand-new church, but it was good to, to visit with them and get to meet some of them. And then there was this. In that crowd, there was this woman and a couple of other as well, but I just wanted to point out this lady. She was not a Christian. I, I took her picture while Gary Boyd was preaching while Gary Boyd was preaching about the power of the gospel to change lives. And the look on her face was just, I mean, enthralling. She was so focused on what he was saying. And when the service ended and they asked if anyone wanted to obey the gospel, she was one of two women. 
later two more, stood up and confessed Jesus as Lord. We took him down to the river, and this woman there is being baptized into Christ for the remission of her sins. The gospel is powerful. It's powerful in any language, in every nation. People need the gospel. People want to change. They want to be changed by the power of Jesus. And it doesn't matter, if you look at that picture closely of the baptism, it doesn't matter that cows are coming down to that river to use it, or that a few minutes later women came from the local village and filled their buckets up in, in, with that water to use in their household cleaning. That doesn't matter. What matters is somebody had their sins forgiven and they're a child of God. I'm thankful for that good sister that day. That was on a Sunday. The next day was a Monday, and we went out uh, to Kambarami. Uh, Kambarami is uh, actually where Tafadzwa Calvin Kandua has his membership. Uh, that church uh, was there in 2019. It was brand new in 2019. The crowd was small, but I should explain that. Uh, it was a Monday, and the kids had been out of school for a break, and they all had to go back to school <laughs> on that Monday. So this church, when I was there in 2019, there's bunches and bunches of children there, uh, but none of them could be there on this day. So it's all kind of the older folks uh, who came to, to hear us and gather with us. You'll notice again, there's, there's no covering for that congregation, but there Calvin is uh, translating for me, uh, and uh, again, doing the good job that he does. They gave us a chicken. Um, they're so appreciative of, you know, hearing the gospel. They, they gave us this chicken. There Gary is holding the chicken. I think it made it into the uh, trunk of one of the preacher's cars and maybe into his pot, you know, the next day probably, but appreciate the chicken. Um, here we are preaching at uh, Gosha. This uh, another congregation that they've planted. This is uh, one of the newer ones. But again, a good start to it, it seems to me. Uh, Gary's preaching and there and Calvin is translating for him. So uh, the saints at Gosha greet you. They want you to know they appreciate all you. In fact, everywhere we went, let me say this, everywhere we went, the brethren are so appreciative. Thank you for uh, supporting our preacher. Thank you for sending us food when we're hungry. Uh, thank you for some of the brethren for uh, sending us uh, sheet metal, money for sheet metal so we could uh, maybe have a roof to meet under. Thank you for your fellowship. Thank you for your love. We heard that every place we went, every congregation, all of the members and express all of that. We enjoyed a meal together at Tafadzwa's house. That's, um, that's him on the right up there. It's reason. Here's the plate of food, small boys. This is Jane and their three children. These are twins, boy and a girl twin. Uh, that's Tafadzwa's wife. Just a, she's a very, I can only say, she does not lack personality. She's got all the personality anybody would want. She's a very uh, personable person, uh, loves to laugh, and just enjoys life, a great support for, for Calvin and his work. As I said, I'm hoping, Lord willing, to go back to Zimbabwe a week from Thursday, going to this other side and preaching at, uh, working with three groups mainly, uh, as well as doing two preacher studies on that particular trip, and uh, Joe Greer is planning to go with me. I thank you so much for your kind attention tonight. I'm going to be singing this song, Are You Coming to Jesus Tonight? The gospel is the same for every nation, tribe, and tongue. The message is that Jesus, the Son of God, came and lived a perfect life and died for you. You might think tonight that you're stuck being who you are. You're unhappy with your life. You're unhappy with yourself. But you're not. Jesus came so you can live a different life. The gospel is the power to save. The gospel is the power to, save, to change. Be transformed.
If you're ready to obey the gospel, please come while we stand and while we sing. Thank you for watching this video. We're glad that you have found our channel. And in fact, while you're here, we would encourage you to subscribe to the Jones Road Church of Christ channel. We have several videos already up. And we believe you'll find these to be true to God's word, helpful to you in your journey toward God. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us and let us know how we can help you.